few minutes ago, he asked how he should introduce me, and I said, you can introduce me as my mother does, as little Bobby Dunley, or Bill Dunley, or Robert Dunley, it doesn't matter. I have to tell you that this has been a great conference so far, and one of the things I'd like to do is thank the organizing committee for asking me to come in this morning. You know, this is not going to be an address, it's going to be some off-the-cuff remarks for a few moments. But first, I'd, I'd like the organizing committee to stand up so we can give a round of applause. They really did a great job here. Can you guys stand up, please? Hospital and a research fellow at Harvard Medical School. 
In addition, he's a research advisor for PUCAR, which is Partners in Urban Knowledge, Action, and Research, who work in the uh, Kuala Bandar community in Mumbai. Dr. Subaraman is a graduate of the University of Chicago, Yale School of Medicine, UCSF Infectious uh, Internal Medicine Residency, and Brigham and Women's uh, and MGH, Massachusetts General Hospital Infectious Disease uh, Fellowship. In addition, he's a graduate of the Fogarty Clinical Research Fellows Program in which he researched HIV and TB in Chennai, India. What we've asked Dr. Subaraman to talk about today is his work with, with Pukar. Uh, he worked in, uh, in uh, Mumbai, India over the course of, of uh, from 2010 to 2012 as the research advisor for Pukar. Nelson Mandela tells us that poverty is man-made and that we, and Dr. Uh, Pope Francis uh, certainly has reminded us that we need to have a preferential option for the poor. I was quite impressed when I heard his talk on Pukar because it is a, it gives us this, both the scientific tools as well as a community-based interdisciplinary project which can show us how to combat that extreme poverty uh, which exists in our world. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Subaraman uh, and, uh, and excited to hear his talk about this work. So, thank you, Dr. Tomi, for that really gracious introdu introduction. Um, I just want to thank the organizing committee. They've been incredibly professional. And I remember in college and in medical school organizing talks and events and almost no one would show up. <laughs> so, so I think they deserve another round of applause. <laughs> and I feel really humbled to be here for a couple of reasons. The first is that, the first is that uh, I'm in the company of really extraordinary speakers who are many of whom are much more accomplished than I am, so I sort of wonder why I'm up here. But the other is that this work that I'm going to present is really collective effort. And it's a collective effort. Uh, I've been mentored by Anita Patel Deshmukh, a physician who's the head of Pukar, by Professor David Bloom at the Harvard School of Public Health, Professor Arjun Apadori, who's an anthropologist now at NYU, and this extraordinary field team that you'll hear about. And so I just, everything that I'll be talking about today is really representing that collective effort. Can everyone hear me? If you can't, just yell. <laughs> um, so I want to start by a little background on our urbanizing world. So sometime in the early 2000s, our world crossed a significant threshold, with more than 50% of the global population now living in cities. Humanity has become a predominantly urban species. The bulk of this great transformation has been driven by the growth of cities and towns in developing countries, which has been associated with rising incomes and wealth creation, as well as the social freedom and aspiration that has historically been associated with urban spaces. At the same time, poverty and deprivation have been reconstituted in cities in new and fundamentally different ways. One billion people, or around one-seventh of the world's population, now live in urban slums. Different terms are often used to describe these communities, such as informal settlement, shanty town, squatter camp, busty, jopa de badi, favela, or barrio. For example, this is a Pau de Lima favela in Brazil. In Nepal, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and Chad, to name just a few countries, more than 90% of the urban population lives in slums by some estimates. And yet, even as slums have come to comprise the predominant mode of urban living in some countries, as the title of this talk suggests, they remain off the map in multiple ways. In a basic sense, these settlements are often literally not on the city maps used by policymakers. In a metaphorical sense, these communities are subject to forms of social exclusion that render their livelihood, health, and well-being invisible. Consider the case of Mumbai, India, which by some estimates has the largest slum population in the world. About 55% of its 12 to 20 million people live in informal settlements. And in India, there's a divide between notified or government-recognized slums and non-notified slums, which are not recognized by local governments. Non-notified slums are generally denied access to the municipal water supply, 
sanitation infrastructure, electricity, land tenure, and housing rights. One fifth of Mumbai's population, entire population, live in non notified slums and therefore exist in a state of legal exclusion. The central argument of my talk is that legal exclusion is one of the defining determinants of health in contemporary developing country cities. And to make this argument, I will present research findings from a non notified slum called Kalabandar, or KB, which we have been studying since 2009. KB is located on Mumbai's eastern waterfront, on an area that was once a booming port. 14,000 people are wedged onto a wharf that juts out into the ocean. Many of the open spaces are maintained for heavy industries and for ships to dock. And this means that the population on areas of the wharf has a density of about 300,000 people per square kilometer, which is six times the density of daytime Manhattan, except distributed throughout one to two story shanties rather than in skyscrapers. Now this photo gives you a sense of the built environment. Shanties go right up to the ocean's edge on the wharf, such that many people can only reach their homes by walking in a single file line. And the lanes and the slums are incredibly narrow. Now, KB was originally settled six or seven decades ago by migrants from the South Indian state of Tamil Nadu, who were recruited to work on Mumbai's burgeoning port. And as the port has slowly gone defunct in recent years, many Tamil men now work in the local shipbreaking industry, as pictured here in a photo of mine by a friend who's a Reuters photographer. Shipbreaking is frequently cited by the International Labor Organization as one of the highest risk occupations in the world, exposing workers to asbestos and lead paint and putting them at high risk for loss of land. Most other Tamil men work as garbage collectors or sanitation workers for the city government. In the last two decades, KB has also witnessed extensive migration from the poorer North Indian states of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. And most of these families run small scale industries producing bags, belts, and other trinkets for consumption by the middle and upper classes. For example, this man makes belts, while this man sprays a chemical on old cloth to make it look new and resells it. Now, in 2009, Dr. Anita Patel Deshmukh at the top center, who is the executive director of Pukar, a Mumbai-based research collective, joined forces with Professor David Bloom at the Harvard School of Public Health in the center, and with Professor Arjun Apadore, an anthropologist at NYU, who's at the bottom center, to start a research project focusing on KB. Jennifer O'Brien at the top left, put immense work into helping getting the project off the ground. And in the right column, are my, and at the bottom left are my colleagues, Kiran Shrutika, Bejal, and Mahesh, who were involved in designing and conducting field research for nearly every project. The initiative started in 2009 with projects by HSPH students, and I was based in by helping to design and lead field research projects from 2010 to 2012. Now, at the start of the project, the team had to solve a basic problem. How do we locate a people in a settlement with such extreme density without any formal address system, not to mention that any given lane in the community spirals off into a complex series of sublanes and sub sublanes, such that, and, and on top of that, most homes have two families living in them with a loft structure to each end. Many researchers solve this problem by GPS mapping homes, but in our case, the spatial area of the GPS device is 33 feet, and each home is about 15 feet in, in length. Also, the roofs of most shanties are contiguous, which makes them impossible to actually communicate with satellites in the open sky. So Kiran Chukig and Dejal Pukar came, came up with a brilliant solution to this problem by creating a household coding system, which we recently described in the journal PLOS One. So for example, this code for this home, T6LSL2R2D, indicates that the home is in the T6 lane, in the second sublane on the left, the second home on the right, and that the family lives down, or in the lower floor of the shanty. Or this code, one of our more complicated ones, S7RSL1RBL1L1U, means that it's the seventh lane, the first sublane on the right, the first by lane on the right, the first house on the left, and the upper shanty, upper part of the shanty. And while this seems cumbersome, it's genius says that it serves as a set of walking directions. So we could give a random code to any member of our research team, and that person could find a home within five minutes. And I've been to other projects where they spend half the day asking all everyone's neighbors, even with GPS maps, to find a home. This coding system actually allowed us to GPS map all homes by mapping entry points to the lanes and sublanes and then using the codes to estimate where a household should be. Just sort of a novel solution to this problem of mapping homes using GPS in a place where it's otherwise impossible. Another methodological innovation is that our survey data are collected by a group we call the Barefoot Researchers. Barefoot Researchers are local youth, many of whom live in KB, and all of whom have at least a high school education. They are the core of Pukar's community-based participatory research model, which views research as an opportunity for empowerment and self-transformation of the barefoot researchers themselves. 
In 2010, our team conducted a major biometric survey in the community. Every weekend over a period of nine months, we set up a tent on KV's main road. The barefoot researchers would fan out into the community to collect basic health data using a questionnaire. They would then recruit the residents back to the tent where we collected information on biometric indicators including height, weight, head circumference for infants, blood pressure for adults, and we collected data on more than 1,700 households or 6,063 people including 811 children under five years of age. In a paper published in 2012 in the journal Environment and Urbanization, we asked the question, how does health in KB, which is a non-notified slum, compare to health in notified or legally recognized slums? And in trying to answer this question, we compared health, KB's health information to data for a representative sample of about 1,100 homes that were notified or mostly legally recognized slums captured in the 2005-2006 National Family Health Survey, which is India's major and official demographic <laughs> health survey for the country. Now, our comparison revealed dramatic differences between the two groups, with KB underperforming on almost every health indicator. As this table shows, with regard to child health, KB's infant mortality rate is more than twice the rate of other slums. The prevalence of fully immunized children was less than half the rate in other slums. The prevalence of underweight children was 10% greater than in KB, and the institutional delivery rate was 8% lower. With regard to adult health, while there was no difference in women's undernutrition rate, men are substantially more undernourished, with 32% being underweight, as compared to 26% in other Mumbai slums. And with regard to educational attainment, the prevalence of illiteracy is more than three times as high among men and twice as high among women in KB as compared to other slums. And I should remind you again that this is not comparing KB's findings to the general population. It's comparing them to other slums that are legally recognized. And the rates we found here were really comparable to some of India's poorest rural and tribal districts. Except KB isn't in a rural or tribal district. It's in the second largest city in India, about six kilometers from the stock exchange, which is the financial epicenter of one of the world's fastest growing economies. So we hypothesized that KB's non-notified status was a primary determinant explaining its relative deprivation compared to other slums, which raises the more general question, how might legal exclusion influence health outcomes? So in the next part of this talk, I will address this question using findings from two of our studies. First, a study of water poverty, and second, from a study of mental health. Now, to understand water poverty in KB, you first have to remember that KB is barred from legally accessing the municipal water supply. And that people obviously still have to get water somehow, um, because it's required to sustain life. KB residents buy water from informal vendors who the media sometimes pejoratively refer to as the water mafia. Now these informal vendors use motorized pumps like the ones pictured here to tap into municipal water pipes. The water is then funneled through hoses attached to the motors. These hoses travel hundreds of meters through a massive oceanside garbage dump that surrounds KB and many of the hoses are riddled with holes and tears. The hoses reach lanes in KB where people line up to fill water containers. Now, water flows through the hoses a maximum of two hours a day, and those timings are very unpredictable. Sometimes water doesn't show up for days on end. So as a result, the water filling times are really hectic and crazy, with dozens of people scrambling to access one of the hoses before the water runs out. People store water in two different containers. Large 100 to 300 liter drums are used to store water for large volume uses, such as washing clothes, washing dishes, and bathing. And you may notice from the photo that these water drums are locked which is not surprising given the cost of water, which I'll talk about in a second, which constitutes a substantial proportion of people's income. Finally, smaller 10 to 35 liter containers are used to store drinking water. And due to the unpredictability of the water supply, again, these are stored for days on end often before they're used. Now, every three to four months, the government officials raid and confiscate the informal water vendors, motorized pumps and mass, completely shutting off water access to the entire population of 14,000 people. In such situations, KB residents roll large blue drums a kilometer or more to access water from private taps located outside of the slum. Men leave work and children temporarily drop out of school, as you can see from this photo. Now, when we decided to study KB, we realized that we had to study this informal water distribution head on. To study water quality, rather than just randomly testing samples, we tried to understand where water might be contaminated, contaminated along this complex chain of water distribution and storage. We formed relationships with informal water vendors so that they would let us test our, their water after getting informed consent. In three different season, we, seasons, we tested water from four of the motorized pumps that tap into the water supply, 
then from six hoses that come out of those same four pumps, and then from 21 households su supplied by those six hoses. So we could actually trace access. These are photos are of our team collecting water from the hoses, large storage drums, and small drinking water containers. And our findings were a bit surprising. Except for a few samples in the monsoon season, none of the water samples collected from the motors or hoses were contaminated, despite the fact that they trash travel through this massive trash dump. However, 76% and 43% of drinking water containers were contaminated with total coliform bacteria and E. coli, respectively. What this finding shows is that most contamination of water actually happens inside the household, after people have gotten water and after they stored it. Since drinking water is stored in wide mouth containers, fecal matter was getting into the water from people's hands and from house flies that enter the water. And this finding highlights two possible solutions to this problem. First, having an in-home water tap and a reliable supply, something most of us take for granted, would eliminate the need for prolonged water storage in unsafe containers. That's the sort of big picture solution. Newer studies have shown that having an in-home water supply has dramatic reduction in diarrheal incidents, even compared to uh, community taps. Second, the use in the short term, the use of safe water storage containers, which are containers with openings too small for people to put their hands in, such as the one pictured below, might provide health benefits, as would household chlorination of water. Now, in our study, we also assess other water, water indicators that I think are substantially more important than bacterial contamination. For example, we found that the price of water people pay in KB is 52 to 141 times greater than the price paid by other city residents who have legal access to Mumbai's water supply. When we measured the price people paid for water after one of the government raids, we found that they were paying 206 times the cost paid by other city residents. On average, households spend 8% of their income on water, but in the summer season when water is scarce, they're spending 16% of their income. Now, to put this in context, when we talk about catastrophic health spending, a lot of definitions say that's anywhere from 5 to 20% of one's income that you acutely spend on health. And so by certain definitions, you could argue that people are almost in a persistent state of catastrophic spending on water. We also assess the quantity of water people use. And to put this in context, it's important to understand how much people, how much water we need, because we don't think about this. The WHO suggests that 50 liters per person per day is the minimum amount required to fulfill basic tasks such as drinking, bathing, cooking, washing clothes, and fulfilling sanitary needs. Anything less than 20 liters per capita per day is severe water poverty associated with high health risk. Access to an adequate quantity of water results in deterioration of hygiene of the hands, body, clothes, and eating utensils, which promotes diarrheal, parasitic, and skin disease. And in fact, some water experts argue that inadequate water quantity is more detrimental to human health in many places than inadequate quality. And 50 liters per person per day isn't much water. The average American uses 379 liters per person per day from the EPA website for indoor uses. This means this doesn't count water in your lawn. So when we, we went in and we actually figured out a way of quantifying how much water people use in large-scale large, large scale surveys, and our study showed that 95% of households don't meet the minimum recommended minimum water use of 50 liters per person per day. And nearly half don't get 20 liters per person per day, putting them at high health risk. The median daily water use is 23 liters per person per day, which means that we use 17 times more water on a daily basis than do people in KB. Now, conducting interviews in KB made me realize how much I take water for granted. For example, a 30-year-old woman from Tamil Nadu who was in KB had this vivid description of the impact of water poverty on her life. She said, Suppose water doesn't come for 10 days. After five days, we begin to run out of water and I can't complete my housework. My main preoccupation is wondering when water will come again. All of our clothes accumulate in the house because we can't wash them. During those times, I have a lot of tension. At some point, even cooking food becomes difficult. And in the end, if we aren't washing clothes or the dishes or cooking, we have to make sure we have enough to drink. Water usually comes to us again after one week. And if it doesn't come after a week, it's unbearable. The more I talk to people, the more I realize that the devastating impact of water poverty extend far beyond health. Now, don't get me wrong, most studies of slums show that diarrhea is one of the top two causes of infant mortality. And in KB situation, the water situation almost certainly contributes to this disproportionately high infant mortality rate. But what struck me more was how people describe making difficult decisions, such as whether to buy food or water that day, because they couldn't afford both due to the high cost of water. 
Or when fathers describe having no choice but to pull their children out of school to fetch water after a government raid. Or when women describe staying up all night without sleep, knowing that water might suddenly start flowing at midnight, 2 a.m., 4 a.m., or maybe not at all. So I think you can see how these experiences studying problems such as water poverty got us thinking about mental health. And in 2001, 2012, sorry, we decided to conduct a study of mental health, which was supported by an NIH fellowship from the Fogarty, Fogarty Center, and has recently been published in the journal Social Science and Medicine. Now, in trying to understand mental health in a community like Haiti, we asked a few questions. First, does living in a slum take a psychological toll? If so, is the psychological toll of slum living simply a product of income poverty, or is there something unique about the slum environment that contributes to poor mental health outcomes? And what is the role of KB's condition of legal exclusion in contributing to psychological distress? And to answer these questions, we engaged in a mixed method study with both qualitative and quantitative phases. In the qualitative study, we interviewed 40 individuals, specifically 20 men, women, 19 men, and one transgender individual, and conducted six focus group discussions. We use a sampling framework that captures the full ethnic and religious diversity of the community. In the quantitative phase, we administered a survey to a randomly sampled group of individuals in KB who were chosen using a random number generator to select homes from our database of household codes. And to objectively select adult, we, an adult in each household, we used a fish table. Now, we put incredible efforts into finding and everyone who was randomly selected. So since many of our barefoot researchers live in the community, we were, we were able to go to homes at after 10 p.m. at night for people who work uh, up until 10 p.m. all days of the week. As a result, our non-response rate was low at 9%, and we had a final sample of 521 respondents. To, to measure mental health, we used the General Health Questionnaire, or GHQ, to screen for the two most common mental health problems, clinical depression and generalized anxiety. Together, together depression and anxiety are co often common, co called the common mental disorders, and I will refer to them as CMDs throughout the rest of the talk. We also administered a slum adversity questionnaire by combining them into a single slum adversity index score, which had a normal distribution in our population. The slum adversity index captures real differences in exposure to a wide variety of stressors. For example, those at the lowest percentile of the slum adversity index are much less likely to have their home demolished by the government, to have been severely exposed to rats, or to have to sleep sitting up due to lack of space in their home. From a burden of disease point of view, the major finding of our study is that 23% of people in our sample or nearly one fourth of all KB residents had a GHQ score of five or more, which means they likely have a common mental disorder. And then trying to compare this finding to other studies, <clears throat> we found that most other population-based studies in India that use a similar screening questionnaire only looked at particular demographic groups such as women between the ages of 18 to 45, or people over the age of 65. But when we broke our data and our sample down by these age or gender categories to facilitate comparison, KB consistently had a higher prevalence of CMDs. Now our findings suggest that KB has one of the highest population-based prevalence rates of common mental disorders in India, if not the highest. We then performed a multivariate logistic regression analysis to identify risk factors associated with having a CMD. And this analysis yields a few statistically significant findings. First, female gender age greater than 45 years and being of Maharashtrian or Nepali ethnic origin and having a physical disability were all associated with a moderately increased risk of having a CMD, while increasing education was protective against having a CMD. Second, income and poverty-related variables have a very strong association with the risk of having a CMD. Most notably, those suffering from severe food insecurity are 10 times more likely to have a CMD. And increasing household income was protective against having a common mental disorder. And third, and the most interesting finding of our study is that after controlling for income and poverty-related factors, the slum adversity index has a strong independent association with the risk of having a common mental disorder. And the easiest way to understand this association is to look at a pre predicted probability chart uh, of the risk of having a CMD at different percentiles of the slum adversity index. So for example, if you have the low or relatively low slum adversity index score of four in the 10th percentile, if you look there on the right, you have about a 10% risk of having a common mental disorder. Whereas if you go up to the 90 percentile, those who have a slum adversity index score of 11, they have a 32% probability of having a CMD. 
And again, these are predictive probabilities after controlling for income, poverty-related factors, and demographic variables. Now, this suggests that the slum environment may have a substantial impact on mental health outcomes independent of income. And in some ways, it really addresses core questions about the very meaning of poverty. This finding is in line with broad pro approaches to conceptualizing poverty, such as Amartya Sen's capabilities approach, which argues that poverty must be understood not simply as monetary income, but rather should be measured using a wide variety of indicators that represent things people have a reason to value in life. In this case, things like having access to a toilet seat, having an electricity meter, not having to travel a kilometer to get water, freedom from rats, and not having had your home demolished by the government. A qualitative part of this mental health study provides a sense of precisely how adversities included in the slum adversity index cause psychological distress. They provide a sense of how these adversities are connected to Katie's underlying condition of legal exclusion. And since the time in this presentation is too short to give any meaningful presentation of these qualitative findings, I'm just going to provide a few reflections on them. First, the, in, the interview suggests that most of these slum adversities are deeply rooted in Katie's situation of legal exclusion and that legal exclusion is both a passive and an active process. To provide one example of legal exclusion as a passive process, the government has failed to collect solid waste over the decades of KB's existence due to its non-notified status. As pictured here, this has resulted in a massive agglomeration of garbage that extends several meters out into the ocean and around the, around the entire wharf in low tide. As another example, large-scale fires burned down 9% and 3% of homes in 2010 and 2013, respectively and the damage from the 2013 fires pictured here. The 2013 fire started because an overloaded fuse box caught fire, which is a common occurrence since most households have to steal electricity using unsafe wiring because they can't legally access the electricity supply. Other passive aspects of legal exclusion that emerge from the interviews are the government's failure to extend water or sewage infrastructure, its failure to provide community block toilets, the lack of provision of schools on central government land, I could go on, but the point is that the government passively fails to extend to KB a wide array of basic services and resources that are the expectation of any urban citizen and which are considered to be entitlements by the other 80% of the city's population. Now, the most visible active form of legal exclusion is forced eviction and home demolition. The entire KB community has actually never been as, under as much threat as it is now. After a major election last year, the new government in power is keen to redevelop the port lands of Mumbai which has some of the few open spaces left in what is arguably the densest city in the world. And just two weeks ago, two lanes in KB were demolished, as shown in this new newspaper article, with almost no notice. Other active aspects of legal exclusion include, that came out of the interviews include government raids on the water motors, threats of arrest and assault against those who engage in open defecation, cutting of electrical wires, solicitation of bribes for expanding homes, Again, I could go on, but the point is that the enforcement of legal exclusion requires active threats and acts of violence and persecution by the state, and not just neglect. Such actions often have the feel of collective punishment on the people of KB for their very existence, or rather, for their official non-existence. KB residents feel this sense of exclusion in a very palpable and sometimes violent way. It is enforced on their bodies. It shapes their identities. It transforms the way they see themselves, and not in a positive way. So this quotation from a 35-year-old woman is one example of how people express the sense of exclusion, which results from being stripped of all social entitlements. She said, we have our name on the voting card. We always go to vote, but look at the condition of our area. It does not look like the rest of Mumbai. I feel like people treat us differently. I don't feel like I live in Mumbai. They don't consider us part of Mumbai. We live in garbage. So I want to end on that depressing note. <laughs> Instead, I want to provide a few examples of how we try to use our research and advocacy for social change in, in a very difficult environment to do so. So when I arrived to work in Mumbai with Pukhar in 2010, the research team was a bit disillusioned. After the initial year and a half of conducting exploratory research, the field team felt a growing responsibility to address the health and social disparities they had witnessed. Yet Pukhar had many limitations as a relatively small NGO and research collective. Our research wasn't being conducted out of a hospital or clinic. 
where we could deliver clinical care. We had no connections to the government. We didn't have any money to buy medical supplies or to hire doctors other than myself and Dr. Patel Deshmukh, who were already a bit overwhelmed by the project's ambitious scope. But we also had many strengths. Bukhar is a prominent voice in Mumbai civil society, and in India, democratic debate is taken very seriously. I think much more so here than here in the US. Our research team had forged relationships with leaders in KB. We had gained the trust of a community that was normally very suspicious of outsiders with good reason. Most importantly, we had unparalleled reach within the community because of our barefoot researcher team. And so we figured out ways of creatively using our research for action and advocacy. First, we formed connections with King Edward's Memorial Hospital, one of Mumbai's major public hospitals. And during the biometric study, we screened around two-thirds of the adult population for hypertension, newly diagnosed hundreds of patients with high blood pressure, and connected them to treatment and care. Similarly, during the mental health study, we detected more than 100 people who had likely severe depression or generalized anxiety and referred them to care at King Edward Hospital, which was one of the few public mental health clinics in the city. So these are simple ways we tried to incorporate things into our research. When we conducted a study of the household costs of diarrheal illness during the monsoon seasons when about one third of households get flooded and when diarrheal illness is essentially ubiquitous, we had our barefoots go out and educate every occupied household in KB, and I mean every household, about the warning signs of severe diarrhea that needs medical attention. We also educated each household about how to appropriately use oral rehydration solution. And we gave ORS packets to every household where people had diarrhea. But still, when I got there, we, had, we didn't have that much data, but we had data, and I, I was just struck by how shocking it was. And one of the things that really disturbed me was the immunization rate and again, which was 29% to sort of remind you, which is less than half other slums in the city. And one lucky thing that happened was we were invited to a public forum of the city's NGOs, and while all the other NGOs sort of bragged about their organizations, we, my colleague Dachel and I gave our first presentation entitled Off the Map at that time, where we pushed this point about KB's remarkably low immunization rate, and the Municipal Health Commissioner was in attendance. Using GPS maps, we argued that KB is more than two kilometers from any public health clinic or pharmacy. And on top of that, more than being two kilometers away, it's essentially cut off from all these clinics by one of Mumbai's major railway lines, which if you know anything about Mumbai, is sort of a major dividing force in the city. Now, at that time, the health commissioner promised us that she would look into, issue and into the issue and because she was publicly challenged on it. And when she didn't get back to us after a month, we kept making appointments to see her. We got stood up twice, but kept going back. And when we finally got into her office, she said this. She said, Kala Bandar may be on poor trust land, basically saying they're non-notified or legally excluded. But after all, they are residents of Mumbai. And she meant it, because the very next week, the city started bringing twice monthly health camps to KB with a team of doctors, immunizations, and basic medications. And on health camp days, we would have our barefoot researchers head out into the community to recruit people, sometimes using a megaphone as pictured here. We took on the role of distributing and putting up announcements such as this one in KB a few days before the health camp to help recruitment. And we had our barefoot researchers educate every household in KB about immunizations and give, again, we created handouts for every single household in the community. This, for example, is a pictorial representation of the Indian immunization schedule with the exact location where the injection will go, the drops for polio, the location of BCG, and exactly when you should get it throughout the birth to five years of age. Then, this is another example. I think this would be very helpful in California right now, actually. Um, this, should, this is a pictorial representation of the consequences of not getting immunized. So in the upper left is polio, and in the upper right is measles, and the lower left is tetanus, and then there's jaundice in the bottom right for viral hepatitis. And on the right is a healthy child with a whole bunch of immunizations surrounding it. Again, very helpful for California. <laughs> This shows Jacinta, one of our barefoot researchers, educating a mother in KB. I should say that the education in health camps worked. Women lined up to get their children immunized, as you see in this photo, in mass. It was really a remarkable response, because some people argue that, oh, it's lack of literacy, it's lack of education, it's the fact that people don't want immunizations. But that wasn't the case at all. This is Dr. Abhijit, one of the government doctors providing immunization. And these are some of our satisfied customers. <laughs> 
And we showed the data that this worked. We repeated our immunization survey two years after we had started the camps, and we got the immunization rate up to 91%. It's probably one of the highest in Mumbai, even in non slum populations at 79%. Now, we haven't been successful in all of our advocacy efforts. Right after we had the success with immunization, we said, well, let's go to the water commissioner. And we did, after getting stood up <laughs> a couple of times. But we made it in the door, and we got to see the water commissioner. And he promised, a, he actually got what they call a no objection certificate to be able to build pipes on the land. And he promised that a water supply would come. And we even used our data to lay out an equitable plan for where water taps should go. Because this is, it's critical that you can't have a handful of water taps, then you don't really solve the problem. We looked at the distribution of the population in different lanes and said water taps should go here to get, have an equitable distribution of water taps, community water taps where people can get enough water. Well, that water supply got mired in legal, legal difficulties and has, hasn't made any progress. Not surprisingly, bringing a water supply to a community is a lot harder than bringing health camps. And yet there's still rays of hope. Last month, the Mumbai High Court delivered a truly historic judgment, the result of years of legal advocacy by a group called Pani Maksamati. The court ordered that the government should provide water to all slums, and I mean all slums, including non-notified, legal excluded settlements. And if this judgment holds, it essentially ends legal exclusion with regard to the right to water. And I got my hands last week on a copy of the High Court's judgment, I was thrilled when I read through it. Judge Oka and Gadhari said this, they said, the right to life guaranteed by Article 21 of the Indian Constitution is not of animal existence, but is the right to live with human dignity. And that was their very simple, elegant argument for saying that everyone deserves water in the city. Not very complicated. And all I can say to that is amen. <laughs> so I want to end with this photo, which is very special to me because it's the first day that the government brought health camps to Galapantar. Shritika was one of our uh, researchers with regards using the bullhorn to call people from KB to come to the health camps. And that's actually what Pukar means. It means a clarion call. What we've tried to do with our works is to channel Katie's collective voice and to tell its story. And I think you'll agree that that story of Galavandar is an ethically troubling one. It is ethically troubling for the city of Mumbai, it is ethically troubling for India, and it is ethically troubling in a global context in light of the one billion people living in slums worldwide. We try our best to tell that story, to put out that clarion call, and we hope that people will listen. So I just want to thank all of you for listening today. These are our funders, and uh, this is the acknowledgement of a lot of the people who are involved in various ways in the project. Thank you.